When I was meditating about Hanukkah 2019, because I, I like to meditate with the Lord, and I like to ask him, so is there a Hanukkah message? I know the Hanukkah story. You know the Hanukkah story. I can retell it, but I really heard God say that in 2020, I really did, that we have to be more of a Hanach. A Hanach is the root word of Hanukkah. It means to be really dedicated onto the Lord. And he told me, we, I, I, and I think we need to be more of men of God. He, he said this, you're going to think this is crazy. It's not like we need a massive haircut, but we all need a trim, if that makes any sense to you. Okay, that was weird. So then I said, okay, okay, so I'll give the Hanukkah message. We need to be more dedicated onto the Lord. And I'm sure there's not one person in here who can go, no, I'm good. I'm really dedicated. And there's no room for improvement. So it's a no-brainer. It's like ask people, you know, you ever have low back pain? Silly. But so I don't want you to think that's some great revelation, but I really feel like God spoke that to me. But then he said, he said, take a look at the book. So, you know, when you know somebody really well, you don't need a lot of information. Like Bernadette, she just has to see a look from me, and she knows exactly what I'm thinking. We could be out in public and just a look. In fact, this is kind of crazy. We were in a fresh market the other day. I was, uh, went to a doctor, and we stopped there to get something uh, for breakfast, and all the people in Fresh Market know me. So I'm talking to this lady, I'm praying. I said, you never met my wife, you've got to meet my wife. And she was all the way, if you've ever been there, at the bathroom. And I was all the way by seafood. And she goes, where is she? I said, it's at the bathroom. She goes, are you going to go get it? I said, no, she, she knows my call. She goes, get out of here. I just yell, ca-ca! Bernadette turns around <laughs> and starts walking. <laughs> starts walking. So she's like, that's unbelievable. I gotta get a, my husband's got to get a call from me. So when you know somebody really well, you know what I mean? You just, you just, you know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's years, 35 years, and we've... So when you're with the Lord a lot, he might have to just say one thing, and you know. You know. And so I knew he wanted me to go to the Bible, and I knew he was talking 2020. So I immediately went to the Bible. I opened up Genesis. There's no 2020, which is what I knew, but I checked. Then I went to, I went to Exodus, and this is what I found in Exodus 2020. It said, Moshe answered the people. This is right after they got the Ten Commandments. Don't be afraid, because God has come only to test you and make you fear him so that you won't commit sins. And I was like, that's it. This goes in line with me, more dedicated, more of a chanach. That's it. We're supposed to fear God more. And if we really feared God, then we wouldn't commit sins. Or as many, at least, right? We would, we would think about it more. So I was like, I'm done. And God says, yes, but... I just wanted to make sure, because it's not easy to absolutely hear. It's easy to hear his voice, but sometimes, you know, you go, so that's it, that's it. We can leave, 2020. So I just want to run through this painstaking, arduous task I did of finding every 2020 in the Bible, okay? And you'll see why this was it. I'm going to go through it real fast. The next one was in Leviticus. This is what it said. If a man goes to bed with his uncle's wife, he's, I'm thinking, that can't be a message for everybody. <laughs> I mean, I don't even have an uncle. So it just doesn't apply. You know, it talks about sexual sins, and this is a sin, but that can't be the message for 2020. Okay, then I went to Numbers, and there was 2020, and it said, um, but he said, you are not to pass through, and Edom came out against them with many people. So just to put it in context, you know, the children of Israel are going to go into the land, but they got to travel east. They were told to travel east through the territory of Edom. The king of Edom refused the people's safe passage. Who's Edom? Esau. Esau's people, just so you know. I was like, that, that, I guess you could, if you really want to dig, you could find some spiritual message there. But I don't think God wanted me to dig with these. I, it was supposed to be obvious. So I was like, okay, let's scratch that. Next, Deuteronomy has a 2020. If you know that certain trees provide no food, you may destroy them and cut them down in order to. Be, but I'm thinking, it, this talks about warfare. God's very particular. Let's see how particular God is and how God looks out for everything. The children of Israel were to preserve what was useful instead of engaging in wholesale destruction of the land during a time of war. God even cares about the trees. I mean, we don't even care about people. But I was like, mm, is that the message? No. Judges 2020. Then the army of Israel went out to attack Benjamin and set up their battle line in front of Giva. If you know what's going on here, the tribes of Israel were declaring war on the tribe of Benjamin because of the detestable and abominable behavior towards the Levite and his concubine, remember? But 
not, 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 you know, again, you could probably spiritualize, which is dangerous, but I, God was definitely looking for something a little bit more literal, and I was like, nope. Next, um, 1 Samuel 20, 20, I will shoot three arrows on one side, and if I'm shooting at a target, okay. Jonathan shoots arrows to keep David safe from Saul. Next, 2 Samuel 20, 20, Joab answered, heaven forbid, heaven forbid that I should swallow or destroy anything. He's in the northern land, the city that was known, it was called Beth Lecha, known for its um, wisdom and known for its wise teachers. He's hunting down this wicked rebel from the tribe of Benjamin, Sheba, and a woman just said, you're not going to destroy this beautiful land just for one person. Not, not, the, not the message. First Kings 20, 20. Each one killed his man, Aram fled, and Israel pursued them. Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on horseback with some of the cavalry. Ahab attacks Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. Second Kings 20, 20. King Hezekiah builds a pool and a tunnel by which water could be brought into Jerusalem from a well outside the city. We'll be seeing that. Now, Ezekiel 20, 20, it's a little warm. Keep my Shabbats holy. Okay, by the way, I still think that applies in the New Testament, but, you know, that's just me. I'm thinking, why did God only bring non-commandments forward? That sounds ridiculous. But, you know, ridiculous things are believed all the time, right? Who cares? But I'm like, is this just a mess about Shabbat? I don't think so. Proverbs 20, 20, whoever curses his father or mother's lamp will go out in total darkness. Cursing one's parents is a capital offense. But I'm thinking, nah, I don't know if that's a message for us. I think most of the kids here are pretty respectful of their parents. And if they're not, their parents will let them know about it. Job 20, 20, because his appetite would not let him rest and his greedy let nothing escape, calamity will befall the greedy. Second Chronicles 20, 20, um, King Jehoshaphat fights against the Ammonites and the Moabites. By the way, the Ammonites and the Moabites were the ancestral, incestuous offspring of Lot and his daughters when his daughters got him drunk. Problems, problems, problems. Problems beget problems. You do the wrong thing, wrong things happen. It's just the way it goes. Uh, Matthew 20, 20, the mother of James and John asked Yeshua that her boy sit on the, either side of him in the coming kingdom. Luke 20, 20, the chief priests and the scribes sent spies to trick Yeshua into speaking out against Caesar. I'm not feeling it. John 20, 20, there's a good one. I mean, there's a good one. Yeshua displays the wounds to the disciples that it was truly him, but still not there. Last one, Acts 20, 20, the apostle Paul tells all the people at Ephesus that he held nothing back from them while he was among them. So what happens? I go back to Exodus 20, 20, which I should have never moved on in the first place. Right? I mean, it took time, but it's okay. It's okay to affirm. So this way, I know. Because if I didn't do that, I might have thought, maybe it was John 20, 20, right? So I know. It's Exodus 20, 20. Moses tells the children here, guys, not to be afraid. Okay? They're afraid. They're seriously afraid. Now, why are they afraid? I mean, why do you have to ask? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I want to know. I want to know, like, what's going on? Why are they so afraid? Look at Exodus 20, 18 for a minute. It says, all the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. The mountain smoking because there was fire, and it wasn't a little campfire. It was massive fire breaking out, massive peals of lightning hitting the top of the mountain. Fire, I mean, it's scary, right? right. Some people are just scared of lightning as it is. If there's lightning or even the threat of lightning, get inside, you know what I mean? And thunders, you know, strong. I mean, this is a scary thing. When they saw it, when it says they trembled, they were literally shaking, literally shaking. But I think part of it was the fact that the last time they saw things like this was during the seventh plague of hell. It was fire and thunder, and, and I think they just equated that with judgment. You know what I mean? You know, if your dad comes home and says, hey, I'm home, and then starts burning the place down, and there's thunder and lightning, you're not thinking it's going to be a good night for you. So, so just be reasonable. They're just like, wow, you know, he seems angry, right? This, this, this accompanies judgment. But look at 2020 again for a minute. This is really a very important message, I think. Really an incredibly important message. Just my opinion. But if I'm wrong, I've been wrong before. Moses tells the people, don't be afraid. He says, basically, don't be afraid of the thunder or the lightning or the fire as if they were like one of the plagues of Egypt. He says, don't be afraid of being consumed by them. They will not hurt you. Don't be afraid of dying by the hand of God. They're thinking they're, they're going to be taken out at his presence or by his voice. Be of good courage because the design of God is not to destroy you. You hear this? The design of God is not to destroy you or me, but to instruct us and to do us good. It says it all over the Torah. 
to do us good. That's what it says in the Bible. Whether you believe that or not or feel that or not, I understand. That's your call. But that I'm going by what it says, okay, to do us good. God did not come to kill them, but to test them. This is a big test for all of us. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they agree that a test means to prove by trial. Therefore, when God tests his children, when God tests us, his purpose is to prove that our faith is real or not. And he's proving that to us, not to him. He knows how we're going to do on the test. We need to know where we stand. And we only know where we stand when we're being squeezed. The question is, would they, would the children of Israel take and own him, God, as their king and be subject to his laws? See, God is, God, it it, it is a marriage covenant going on here. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There is a ketubah, there is a best man, there is a bridegroom, there is a bride, there's music, um, there's everything. There's a chuppah, a cloud cover. And he's saying, God's really saying, and he's saying this to us today, I will provide for you, I will protect you, I will ble- your soul will prosper. I will do all that. That's what I, that's my end of the bargain. Your end of the bargain is to obey my ways. That's what you're vowing. That's your part of it. You can't cl- name it and claim it. It doesn't work. No how, no way. So will, will they do this? And so the test basically is the Ten Commandments. Here's your exam. Take it. Let's see how you do. Are you going to fear me and obey me or are you not? And listen to me. When you don't, there will be consequences. Forgive me, but when I hear parents go, one, one and a half. Are you giving him a math lesson? Time out. No, knock out. Knock out. Time out. Go to your room with your PlayStation and your TV and the plethora of toys that you have. I'm laughing because my kids had no toys. They had a couple board games. I was like, what? It looks like Toys R Us in some kid's room. Moses says that testing is there so we would fear God and keep us from sinning. Yes, that's... That's God's MO. That's God's objective, to keep his children from sinning. Because sin is messed up. Sin messes us up and everybody around us. Sin messes the world up. They needed an eternal sacrifice in the Holy of Holies twice a day just to keep a piece of God's manifest presence there. Otherwise, he would have to leave. That's how messed up sin is. Does everybody realize how messed up sin is? And we live in a different age today. Today it's like, I've got to be happy. And I'm in a relationship, and I'm just not happy. And I'm sure God would want me to leave because God wants me to be happy. God wants you to be holy, sister. Fear of God is the conventional phrase equivalent to true religion. If you want to know what true religion is, it's the fear of the Lord, man. That's what it is. I mean, it wasn't my father's teachings that kept me out of trouble in the Bronx and the projects. It was his discipline. I was like, do I want to go through this? That's what I used to have to ask myself. If dad finds out, fear has the sense when it comes to God of being in awe. Just awe. Like, you, you don't even, you're not even comfortable dropping his name. You're not even comfortable kind of talking about him. You're so in awe of his greatness and his glory. It produces this, this reverential trust. Faith doesn't mean you believe. That means nothing. Faith is, is a, a trusting obedience. Faith always has to prove itself. It, it produces obedience. That's how you evidence that you have faith. Just saying you believe, the devil believes Yeshua is Lord. And quoting scripture is wonderful. But that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for a reverential trust 
that includes a commitment to his revealed word. Therefore, when God gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments, it defines the life that God calls his people to live with him and with each other. Can you imagine, I mean, can you imagine a society without laws? I mean, cops pull, pull people over, and people even believe this. They have a bad attitude. What are you doing pulling me over? I don't know. What are you doing going 85 and weaving in and out, moron? This guy's making 40 grand a year, and every time he walks up to a, a car, he's got the potential to be shot by some nut who hates him just because he's a cop. He's enforcing the law. The laws are there to protect. He's serving and protecting. Can you imagine a society where God's laws were stealing, lying, murdering, and adultery is rampant and flagrant? Coveting. Coveting seems innocent, but coveting leads to stealing and lying. We want what we can't get, so we'll do whatever we can to get it. God is about chayim. He's about life. And not just any life, but the good life. A life filled with pleasantness. A life filled with prosperity. And most importantly, a life filled with peace. Peace is something you can't buy or muster up. It's amazing to have peace in the midst of a storm. If we, if we revere God's divine majesty and stay in awe of his greatness and glory, then we would lead a life of obedience. To obey God is to love God. I can't think of any other way we could show our love to God except in obeying him. Somebody said to me recently, you know, that's pretty much your message. That's pretty much the message. We don't change the message. The message changes us. Amen. I think this is what God is calling us to do this year and next year. I think God is telling us to trust him more through a greater level of obedience. God is saying, you know, this sentence is crazy because you see afraid and fear. God's saying, don't be afraid, fear. Right? And the words are very similar. One's a root word. One's yara. The other one is yare. But this is, this is the message, guys. If we fear God, we don't have to be afraid of nothing else. We don't have to be afraid of man, of the future. Now, you might say, Rabbi, I'm afraid of so many things. Because you don't fear God enough. You're trying to do it yourself. You're setting yourself up. You're your own God. You don't realize it because you don't want to realize it. I mean, that's a terrible thing to realize. Rabbi, I'm faithful. I love God. I understand. But you also got your own plans. And God can't interrupt. Because you've got it all set up. You know when you're going to retire, where you're going to live. You've got it all set That's the message for 2020. Don't be afraid. Fear God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we had no fear except of God? Yeshua had no fear except of God. Now, he was in a league of his own. I'll give it to you. I used to think that I could be just like him. I did. I thought if he could do it, I could do it. I stand corrected. I was wrong. Do you know why I was wrong? Because his father is God. And he did not get his sin nature from Adam. He got his nature from a supernature from the Father. He's in a different league. But I could be like him. I could be more and more like him. That's for sure. He wasn't afraid of nothing except God. He did nothing unless the Father told him. Nothing. Nothing. He didn't make a left unless God told him. Amazing. Just amazing. Here's my question, though. Okay, so that's, okay, that's, okay, that's the message, right? Go home. Good, fear God more, trust him more, obey him more, and let's get rid of these stupid fears of everything. The future, health, it's crazy, it's killing us. It's killing us. Not for us, it wasn't meant for us to be so fearful. It sucks the life out of us. Yes, we pray, yes, we love God, but it's killing us. It's stressing us. What's going to happen to my kid? What's going to happen? Stop worrying. If God is God, fear him, obey him, and let him handle it. I was on the phone three hours with this Jewish man. He wouldn't let me off the phone. He said, you're not pushing me. You're not trying to persuade me to believe in Yeshua. No, I can't persuade you to believe in Yeshua. I lift him up to you. 
and I'll answer any question you have. He wouldn't let me go because he said, anybody else that ever talked to me, they just kept hammering me. I go, no, no, I'm not going to hammer you. He got hammered for you. <laughs> but at the end of the, I said to him, at the end of the conversation, three hours, I said, listen to me. And I said this to somebody else, a friend's father recently. I said, when I get off the phone, I just want to be honest with you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to ask God to nail you like only he can. Just, I don't want to, I don't want to lie to you. And that's what I did. Nail him, God. Nail him like only you can, just like you nailed me at the Mount of Transfiguration. Nail him. Here's my question for today, basically. What happens when we've been fearful? And a lot of you are. A lot of you, I don't know you intimately, but I just am believing. I've watched you walk. I've watched you walk through difficult circumstances with children, death, and you've done wonderful. I know sometimes you almost have to feel like you've got to put on that front, but it wasn't a front. It was legit. It was legit, and I'm really proud of you. But what happens, guys, and this is just me talking to my friends. This isn't Rabbi Greg teaching. This is me talking to you. Like, if, if you were in my living room, this is what I'd say to you, okay? What happens when, when we've been fearful, when we've been faithful, when we've been obedient, and hell breaks loose? This is the $64,000 question. This is the question that you don't want to tackle. Why am I tackling it? Because I'm an idiot. Because I should just give a nice message about the parable of the sowers and tell you to keep your heart soft, let the word get in, and let's go get lunch. But what happens to me, and I can only tell you what happens to me, God does something to me personally, and it's not for me. It's something for me to share. When this happens, when all hell breaks loose, or bad, horrible, and I'm talking bad, I'm talking bad news. I'm talking Mr. So-and-so, are you sitting? Your son was involved in an accident. How is he? I'm sorry. I'm talking, I'm not talking that your car breaks down, you got to go out and buy a new engine, you cheap skate. So instead of having $150,000 in the bank, you got $147,000 which you'll never spend anyway. I'm not talking about that. And forgive me for saying that, but it just kind of pisses me off because some people have real problems. So forgive me. Forgive me for being the way I am. I, no, really, forgive me. But I, I say this to just be honest, and I think the body of Messiah has become so weak and so easily offended, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. You're going to handle, you're going to handle tribulation, and the minute somebody says something that's honest and hurts your feelings, you run to another church, then just keep running. You know, just keep running, man. It makes you feel, when this happens, you feel lonely, yeah. right? You feel all alone. Yeah. You feel isolated, right? Yeah. Um, you get confused. All the things that you believed in the light, you start to question in the darkness. You get angry. Is anybody relating to this, or, or am I the only one? I got to know because then I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. It can't, be, it can't be like this. And this, and you feel helpless. You don't know what to do. I'm going to talk more about this next week. I really am. But I had a crisis of faith for a day that I want to sh completely share with you. And it was very painful. Very. When I went for that, that test, I just didn't want to be there again. I didn't want another IV. I didn't want nurses coming in and looking at my medical history and going, my God, six stents and a graft. And a, I, I, I was like, oh, God, you feel so sick. You feel so weak and broken. And they all come in and do it, every single one. And then I had, by the way, doctors out there, try not to do this. This is, this is Dr. Schmuck, okay? <laughs> he says, I said, well, I'm trying to witness to him. I said, it could be worse. He goes, yeah, it could be me. What a comfort. You're an idiot, okay? You are in health care, patient care. When are you going to start to care again? This one doctor I went to see, he spent time and he cared, and I said to him, you're an anomaly. 50, 60 years ago, people went into the medical profession to help people, not for the bucks. I said, sad when you're just a number. These people are scared. They're frightened. Treat them like your own. Treat them like it's your mom. Treat them like it's your wife. Treat them like it's your kid. And I said, you are not like anybody I've met. And I said, I want to commend you. He started crying. 
he started crying. So, I, I, when I have anesthesia, I don't know why, but I don't get out of it too, too well. And I'm lucid and I have crazy dreams. And the doctor had come in and said to Bernadette, um, I heard him say, look, I don't like what I saw in his throat. If I had a bet, 50-50, it's cancer. And I just heard that, and I was like, kidney disease, artery disease. These aren't, you know, artery disease, and then I'm not, I don't want a violin, but it's like it could, you know, it could burst at any time. There's no, it's not like just some high cholesterol. And, and so many things are breaking down on me, and it doesn't really make sense because I did all the right things. You know what I mean? And I want to tell you something about it, because a lot of you don't know. Some of you might have experienced it. But sometimes I'm sitting with my kids, and I'm having dinner. And then out of nowhere, it's uninvited guest. It's a foreign intruder, an invader, like a home invasion in my mind. It just comes and goes, enjoy it. This is your last couple of months with them. So I fight it, right? I fight it. I send it out. It comes back. It comes back. I have to fight it all the time, okay? I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. He says, I don't know what that's like. You don't know what that's like. You don't know what that's like. But it's, it's awful. Maybe, some, maybe you fear other things, like, is my kid going to get into a car accident every time they drive? And you go, oh, Lord, please, and you're on your knees. That's another thing. But that voice is awful. It's awful. It's a killjoy. It's just it's a killjoy. So when I heard that and I thought, cancer, no. I was just upset. So I got home and I had a crisis of faith. I had a vision, and I know it was lucid and it wasn't true, but I had a vision that I was in a pit, that I was like a little boy, and I extended my arms, and God was on the rim of the pit, and I said, please, Father, and he turned his back. Oh. Now, let me just ask you, I'm going to be honest. Has there ever been a time in your walk where you feel like God turned his back on you? Yes. Okay, so we're not alone, and those who didn't raise their hand, you can repent later, you can come up here. And... <laughs> Look, as a minister of the gospel, guys, and as a teacher of God's word, I have to practice what I preach. I don't have a choice. I mean, if you lead a Get Rich seminar, you don't show up in a 25-year-old Honda. And, and if, if you're leading a Get Fit seminar, you don't show up grossly out of shape. Well, I'm, I'm leading a Get Faithful seminar, and I can't show up with fears and doubts. But I want to be totally honest with you. Now, thank God that crisis of faith didn't last a week or a month or a year. It was a day, and I was struggling, and little Lily, you know, saw the struggle, and she's always very sensitive to me, and she came over and hugged me and said, what's going on? I said, your dad's having a crisis of faith, and she said, why? And I told her, and then she went in the classroom, and she handed me something to read, and then she went to bed, and it was really special, and then the next morning, I woke up, and for three hours, I cried and yelled to God, cried and yelled and cried and yelled. I never felt closer. It was actually quite beautiful. There's a, something beautiful about brokenness. And, uh, you know, got me right back with them, tighter than ever. And the last week and a half, it's been unbelievable. Almost like I feel fearless. It's kind of crazy. But the question is, why does bad things happen to good people? This is the question that nobody really can answer. Um, it's probably the most difficult question in theology to tackle. And the quintessential theological answer is this. God is sovereign. Yes. Yes. Meaning, just if you don't know that word because it's a fancy theological word, God has unquestioning supreme power and authority. Or as I like to say, he's the boss. And as the boss, because God's the boss, he does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, where he wants, to whomever he wants. Now, let me just say something. This is just Greg Hirschberg speaking, okay? Let me just say this. If I'm struggling and somebody says God is sovereign, it's not going to help. Yeah. Has it ever helped you? No. Just throwing this out there. Asking somebody to just accept that is a very hard pill to swallow, yeah. especially when you're in the midst of the storm. When you're not in the midst of the storm, it's very easy for you to give advice. You're great at giving advice. You suck in the midst of the storm, though. You're great at counsel. You suck as a player. <laughs> God's sovereignty. This is just me speaking. And if I'm wrong, God forgive me and, and, and family forgive me. But God's sovereignty backs us up into a spiritual corner and causes us to lay down and surrender our will. God's sovereignty causes us to spiritually tap out and say, okay, God, fine, you win. Yeah. 
Have you ever gotten mad where you almost say to God, I'll show you. I'll take it. I'll keep taking it and taking it. You give it. Go ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm not giving up. You're not going to make me quit. Right. And it's not him doing that. First and foremost, when trying to answer this question, we have to acknowledge the fact that as finite human beings, it is just not possible to understand an infinite, omniscient, and eternal God, nor his plans and purposes. Forget about it. We live in the, the, the highway of information, but that's something you're never going to get downloaded. As difficult as that is, what I just said, it is what it is, and nothing you're going to do is going to change that. Secondarily, we like to think of ourselves as good people. We do. Especially, you know, with all the things I'm doing, you would think, you must think of yourself as a good person. I don't. I never think of myself as good. Never. Ever. I don't feel good much of the time. I don't ever feel holy. Never. So what's the benchmark or the yardstick for good? That's the question. This is what the Bible says. I'll just give you a few scriptures. In Psalm 14.3, this is, this is David, and then Ecclesiastes, King Solomon, Romans, of course, the apostles of the Gentiles, great apostle Paul, and the, and the disciple Yeshua loved. So you have a plethora here of scripture, and you read it for yourself. You know what it says. Men are not only sinners by nature, but by action as well, meaning we have a sin nature. That's why the Bible makes a distinction. You'll read a lot in the letters, especially 1 John, 1 John, um, um, maybe the 8th verse in the first chapter, and then the ninth verse, it says sins and sin. They're making a distinction. Sins are the evil acts, the lawless acts we do, and we perpetrate. But sin is our nature. I'm going to tell you something. No sin you ever do will be as bad as your sin nature. All your sins come from that sin nature. That sin nature is what has to be dealt with, not the sins. So although there are no good people, all of us feel the effects of sin. I don't know if you noticed, but sin is so out of control today. I mean, they used to be, even in the 50s, it wasn't as prevalent. Now it's, oh my goodness. I mean, New South Wales is burning, right? New South Wales is burning in Australia. We have a congregation in Australia, so I'm, I'm in touch. New South Wales just passed a week before it started burning. Full-term abortions, meaning a woman could carry a baby for 40 weeks, and then you can kill it as it's coming out. But listen, guys, I'm here to tell you, sin is flagrant in the body of Messiah. Flagrant. So, sometimes we feel the effects of our own sin. Other times we feel the effects of someone else's sin. Drunk driver hits you head on, that's someone else's sin. But you couple that, couple our own sins and other people's sins with the fact that we live in a fallen world full of sin, we all experience injustice. Sometimes it's coming to us, but a lot of times it might not, right? We don't know. At times, it seems like seemingly senseless suffering, right? Why, oh God? Here's just a few things to think about, and I'll get into this more next week because it's already, you know, I'm just, this is an intro, but we'll finish it. One, and this is something I do. I'm giving you something that I do to help me cope, okay? The bad things that happen to us in life are confined to this world. In other words, although the godly suffer as much as the godless, sometimes more, our suffering has an expiration date. Yes. We have an eternity. I know you hear me say this all the time. Why do I say this so much? What would you like me to say, living in a world that has so much sadness and sickness and sorrow? We have an eternity without pain. No pain. It's, you can't fathom it. I can't. I really can't. I can try to fathom it, do the best I can, and it makes me very happy. No sorrow, no sickness. Don't lose your faith, sweet pea, because you lose your faith. You lose this. You lose this. You are done. There is no way you're ever going to be happy. None. Because happiness in this world is fleeting. 
although we exercise, is that smart to do? Of course it is. Although we eat healthy, is that smart to do? Yes, and although we take our fair share of supplements, only our spirits and our souls will be redeemed in this life. I know everybody in this world is holding on to their youth. I get it. So, you know, God forbid you have a wrinkle. <laughs> Our bodies will suffer. This isn't bad news. They will age. They will die. They will. I know you look great. Somebody tells you, wow, you're 60, you look great, and you get all excited. Let them tell you your spirit looks great. Let them tell you your character is great. When's the last time you heard that? When's the last time people boast about the kids say, oh, my kid, oh, she's involved in ballet, and this one's involved in soccer, and oh, they're smart, they're so smart. How's their character? As believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through the bloody sacrifice of Yeshua the Messiah, we will have a reward someday, and it shall be glorious. And you hold on to that, sister. Don't let anybody take it from you. I never get tired of this verse, Revelation 21.4. Never. I read it um, eight million times. I wouldn't get sick of it. He will wipe away every tear. I stop right there. I'm good with that. I'm not boasting. But there in a day that goes by that Bern and I don't cry. We have a lot of good times. We have a lot of laughs. Obviously, we have a great relationship. We laugh a lot. We have a good time. Our family is healthy. We're very tight. It's beautiful. But... What do you think? I, we get a call that so-and-so's got stage four, and we know the guy, and we could just keep laughing? Come on, man. That guy just got hit with a death sentence. He knows it. You go through chemo, and it kills everything. You lose your hair, you sick, throw up, and it's gone for a couple of years, and then, ooh, what happened? Because they didn't get rid of the cancer. That wasn't eradicated. Why is there so much disease? There's so much disease. Okay, technology, we're eating wrong, but it's bigger than that. It's sin. It's sin. We were supposed to give the earth a seven-year rest. I don't care how organic you eat. The soil is depleted of minerals because we had to make money in that seventh year. Why should we let it rest? We'll lose money. Now we're losing our life and losing our mind. There will no longer be any mourning. Hallelujah. Man, I read that. This is, I'm not preaching. I'm excited. By taking a small bit of hell now, our heaven is becoming more and more heavenly. There is nothing in this world. I've been all over. It all looks the same. I could care less. I don't care. I'll take my kids to the, to the, to the Italian Riviera, and I'll take them to Crystal, and I'll have just as good a time, maybe better, because I don't have to pack and spend three grand. <laughs> so the bad things are confined. I'll get into more of this next week. Two, almost, done, almost there, because we choose to believe that God is good, and it's a choice. It's just a choice. It's not it's easy to make that choice, especially in the midst of the storm, but we choose to believe that God will bring good from it all. We've heard it a million times, right? Look, look at the scripture. You know the scripture. You've heard it a gazillion times, Romans eight twenty eight, right? We know. See, it's a matter of we, we know. Genose. We absolutely, we are intimate with this truth. It's, it's in the fiber of our being. It's in our spirit. We're marked. We're sealed. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So it may not always seem so. A lot of times it doesn't, right? And you don't want somebody running up to you just when you got the terrible news and going, Romans 8, 28. I feel like saying Acts 2, 38. What does that say? I wish I had an Acts in 2, 38. <laughs> Guys, think about it. Think about what you would want to hear. Put yourself in other people's shoes, for God's sakes. Stop being flippant. You don't have to have an answer. I don't have answers. I don't always have answers. I don't have the answers. It's not like take two scriptures and call me in the morning. It's not that simple. Sometimes when we are suffering heartbreak, tragedy, I'm talking heavy stuff, disappointment, frustration, and bereavement, we wonder what good could possibly come out of this. But listen, the next verse gives us the answer. Everybody stops right here. Look at the next verse. Because those whom he knew in advance, he also determined would be conformed. Conformed. 
yeah. or become like Yeshua. The word in the Greek is mimites, which we get the word mimic. We're supposed to, the whole idea, once you, once you come to know God, you are going to go on a path of him yes. molding and shaping you yes. into Yeshua. Yes. And it's not going to come through blessing. No. It doesn't. It doesn't. Guys, it doesn't. Has it, has, it, has it for anybody here? Tell me. Whatever God permits in our lives, and nothing goes by his desk without his stamp of approval. Now, did God want you to get divorced? No. Doesn't mean he... Did he permit it? Or did he make it happen? Did he promote it? No, he, you can make any decision you want. Not everything is beneficial, but everything is permissible. You're, God's not going to force you to make my... A couple of my kids are grown. I can't make decisions for them. No. No, impossible. But nothing surprises him. He, he can permit or limit. He can. But he permits things. But if it's designed to conform us in the image of his son, it takes the question mark out of our prayers. We don't have to wonder what's going on. That's what's going on. Therefore, our lives are not controlled by impersonal forces like chance, luck, or fate but by a wonderful, personal, intimate God who is too loving to be unkind and too wise to make a mistake. I love this story about Michelangelo. You know, he's undisputed the greatest sculptor that ever lived and probably ever will live. He was approaching this huge block of mess, of marble, and very pensive. He's stroking his beard, and a friend said, what do you see? He knows he's seeing something, he has a vision. This is what he said, and I quote, I see a beautiful form trapped inside, and it is simply my responsibility to take my mallet and chisel and chip away until the figure is set free. That's what's happening to us. Because suffering chips away at our pride, our self-centeredness, our complaining, our covetedness, our thanklessness, our discontent, and our lack of compassion, just to name a few. Yielding to God will not change our circumstances, but, buddy, it will change us. Yes. Last but not least, and something very important, you say, why can't God stop? Why can't just God stop all the evil? Or why doesn't he stop certain evils? I'll answer that next week, because it's a good question. But God has let us have free reign. And you will suffer, and others will suffer. But what a blessing. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Praise be to God, Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, compassionate Father, God of all encouragement and comfort, yes. who encourages us in our trials so that we can encourage others. Things are going to happen. I'll explain to you why God doesn't stop it. Things are going to happen. Yes. But the blessing, it's not for naught, okay? After being in the hospital for 18 days and them telling me you're not going to make it, when people go in the hospital, I know what they're going through. I could comfort them. I could relate. Somebody here lost a child. You know what? I was going to minister to them right away when I found out, and I did to an extent, but I called up a friend of mine who just lost a child a couple of months before. Yeah. You follow? Yeah. Those with battle scores can better help those going through the battles. Yeah. Or as I like to say, he who suffers much speaks many languages. Yeah. This should remind us that when we are comforted, we should look for every opportunity to pay it forward and pass this comfort on to others. People don't need scripture when they're struggling. They need comfort. Comfort. So, last but not least, one scripture, and we're gone, and I'll, I'll finish this up next week. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him, we might fully share in God's righteousness. So, Yes, family. Yes, bad things happen to good people. But the worst thing happened to the best person. Yes. One who knew no sin was made sin for us. That we who knew no righteousness might become the righteousness of God in him. Heaven's best for earth's worst. And I'm here to tell you, 
no mortal tongue will ever be able to thank God sufficiently for such amazing grace, for such lavish love, and for such tender mercies. All I could say is, hallelujah, a thousand times over. Let's stand together. Um, next week should be pretty, pretty juicy when we, when yes. we finish that. It will be pretty juicy. Yes, I, I promise you that. Um, I love you. Thanks to all the, the leaders. It means a lot to me personally. And uh, thanks to all those who do stuff that we don't always see, moving this and moving that or ministering to people here. There's a lot that goes on here that I don't see, and I know God sees it. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very, very, very grateful, very grateful. This is not a profession, and it's beyond a calling. It's just what we do as believers. And just, again, just appreciate what you have here. Not in me, not in the music. Not in the, what God has done here is just unbelievable. It, it truly is amazing. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai Vayishmarecha Yor Eranoi Ponovelecha Vehunecha Yisa Adonai Ponovelecha Vyasem Lecha Shalom I love you guys, Shabbat Shalom!